Hey, it is your buddy, Peace and Harmony with you here today. We're zooming in and focusing in on a great viewer question, and that was, how does the narcissist think? What is their perspective of the world? And furthermore, what do they think about me, my role in it, and my role in their life? I want to have a real relationship with this person, but we just seem to keep getting stuck, and we keep fighting, we keep battling it out, and we get back together and it's just not working. What is it about this person so I can really know? And I understand this d desire or drive to put a label on somebody, to put the blame, you know, to hang, um, you know, a, a label on them. They are this, they are that. And, you know, furthermore, just realize that all, and I truly believe that all of human behaviors and emotions and expressions of your personality are fluid. I mean, there is neuroplasticity. The, the areas of the brain can rewire themselves. It's like taking a open meadow and then carving a whole new path within it. The brain has the ability to do that, think differently, feel differently, trigger different neurochemicals, trigger different neurohormones into the body so you memorize and experience a whole different state and experience of life some feel it's miraculous when they break through and they see that and they kind of like have an altered mind experience when they're really letting go of that and they're allowing their brain to do what it is. Like they say, you know, we only use 2% of their mind and, you know, the rest is, you know, on tap. So we have so much potential. We're just on the tip of the iceberg. <clears throat> and so if you really want to know and kind of put labels, if it's easier for you to understand things categorically that way, I'm not here to diagnose and treat, but I can help you kind of put some pieces together and help them snap and glue together. So a narcissist, basically, number one, they have a sense of entitlement and pathological self-importance, meaning that they feel basically that the world is there to serve them. It's like it's like the old, uh, you know, Jack, uh, John Kennedy, you know, don't ask what the world, can, your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. It's the other way around with a narcissist. They expect the world to deliver to them. Um, and they have a sense of entitlement, meaning they feel above the law oftentimes. And the law can be politeness, courtesy, playing fair, playing clean, uh, being honest. You know, when you talk about good sportsmanship or playing fair and all that that means, and really kind of the honesty is the best policy. The narcissist isn't really looking at life that way. And they're truly not looking at your relationship uh, that way. Basically, I don't want to say that they, they think as people as dispensable, but it's kind of like they, they will have um, a projected ideal with which they were, you know, project onto the people in their life. In other words, they want to live up to some sort of image in their mind, which is oftentimes disconnected from their internal authentic self. See, that's what's so amazing is that these people have a very public persona. So they're not going to you know, be apt to be open to sharing a lot of private time. In other words, you're not gonna get a lot of heart to far, you know, heart to heart, put your feet up, take your socks off, you know, uh, relax and unwind and don't have to impress all the time. It's there, it's very stressful. Um, life with them, their their image of life is that they feel um, such a pathological sense of self-importance and they have an insatiable need for power. In other words, when they enter into a situation, they're looking for the power move. They're looking for the, the power play. I mean, you can be at a, you know, a, a concert that's in a field and then they're going to come, you know, with everybody walking, they're going to drive up in their Mercedes that, you know, has vocal, you know, vocal commands. I mean, they're just odd things that are, are going to stand out, which are unusual. And you're like, oftentimes that is what is endearing though. <clears throat> and reinforced by the narcissist particularly is these kind of outlandish shows of self-importance. In other words, people tend to really gravitate towards that confidence. But yet there's always someone who pays the price. It's always about you. Re reacting to this person. So it becomes very reactive. And so they expect to be reacted to all the time, not responded to, not where you're working through feelings and then you're in control. They essentially strive to make, you know, to make them in control and everybody else out of control. I mean, it can go from everywhere from having dinner. Um, you can be having a pizza. You can be having a steak. 
you can be having a chicken and they're going to comment and control and look at portions and you just can't be free. There's always going to be some sort of redirective of the attention, the limelight, the money, whatever it is back onto this person. So really they feel that others are like there to serve them. You know, can you give me a back scratch? The back scratch, you know, lasts 45 minutes to an hour's long. Are they doing the same for you? No, not at all. Um, they expect every everybody to basically be there to prop them up. Um, and so you can't really be a leader intrinsically with this person. You can't bring out that innate quality about you where at least, you know, you have that humility and at least you can have a presence. People oftentimes have to camouflage their presence with this person because if they're to have some private time or discuss things that are important to them like true uh, spirituality or true family or true religion or something that they feel in life or experience, you know, they're not real open to hearing that. They're not a real soundboard. They don't have empathy. So they're going to like dodge, like talking to people is like dodging a bullet with them. They don't, they, they're not just necessarily avoidant. They feel it's just deterring from their charm without, you know, whatever it is that they want to present a very public persona. So to them, you know, relationships are all about this show, um, and what they, um, what they can then, um, uh, especially on the covert side where they can just sort of, um, you know, tuck themselves away and not really have to deal with reality. So in other words, things that life is always on their terms. It's not that they have like the best life, but life is always on their ter terms, even when it's kind of unfair to others around them. Unfair meaning that they're not accountable. They are not there to give their opinion. They are so tight lipped. You're surprised that, you know, as they get older and they, and they make these different comments, I never knew you felt this way. I never knew this. I never knew that. It's like you don't really get to know the person because they have a very, either the covert, the very veneer, you know, you can't get behind the veneer. They're so stoic, tight-lipped, um, and oftentimes very successful at what they do, but you never really get a chance to um, get to know them. Um, and so that is part of the deficit is that because of that empathy deficit, you don't really get to know them and you, and therefore you don't really get to know yourself because if you're in a relationship with someone who is like this, who is narcissistic, who basically thinks that others are just there to serve them and they have a sense of entitlement, uh, grandiosity. In other words, you know, they're, they're going to keep putting off the private, the private life, the heart to heart, the coming down, you know, the, the humility. Um, they're, they're, they're going to be very avoidant of that just due to that sense of entitlement and that grandiosity. So it's part of always part of a grand scheme and you kind of feel like you're always reaching for the stars, but the stars just kind of fizzle out. Um, and you feel fizzled out then around them because you can't keep up to their standards, but usually the standards that they're holding to you are nothing that you have inside. So they require that of people. Um, and when you get, you know, a number of these people together, it's, you know, it's basically um, all those people putting on a show. That's why you see a lot of people in Hollywood who are like this. The, you know, the rising stars, the people who want to be on sitcoms, TVs, you know, they, they're not necessarily being their own character. Um, they're being something else like the Jim Carrey. Um, there was a really, um, I found it a disturbing interview with him. <clears throat> on um on his uh, on Netflix and he was doing an interview where he played Andy Kaufman in a movie and he talks I mean if you watch that movie you can see how out of control and God love uh, Jim Carrey I mean he is fabulous but he also suffers from some severe you know depression and you think how could somebody and he says this I mean you should just watch the interview um on Netflix um if you're at all interested in that and to really hear it from it and it really, you know, that to, to hear him say the things that he said, you really are able to see the private life of a narcissist and how hurt and insecure they are, but they never share it. And God love Jim Carrey for sharing, um, kind of that dark side. I mean, it makes him really, you know, you have to have respect for someone who can put their, their true, uh, feelings out there. Um, even when it's so controversial, um, the fact that he 
you know, made $10 million for mask and how he felt about that. You should definitely watch the interview if you're interested to see um, kind of the confession of a uh, of his type of personality. And again, I'm not here to um, diagnose and treat, but I just want you to understand that that oftentimes is what you're going to be experiencing. You're going to feel like there's something not quite real. There's something almost missing. And oftentimes, especially if people are, are children and raised by these types of people, the children will think, well, it has to do, I, I'm the one who did something wrong. You know, there is something wrong with me. I'm inherently flawed. There's something missing and it's my fault. Um, I am inherently flawed. And so children who are not able to live up to the standards, um, oftentimes will not get a chance to experience, they never even get a chance, a shot to be themselves, um, you know, be the one to uh, point out things and be the center of attention the way that they need to be. Kids, you know, if you, if you go in and, you know, and meet kids, I mean, they're fun, be, have, give them the center of attention. It's very relieving when you're around children, let them be educated, let them be their own little people. And they will oftentimes delight you with what they can give back. I mean, it's, but the narcissist, you know, it's, they don't even want to hear from their kids. They, they are very truncated in their relationships. So when they think about people, they want this sort of veneer or exterior relationship. They don't want to hear about the sickness. They don't want to hear about your doctor appointment. They don't want to hear um, about what went on with your day. I mean, they just want things to always look good. Um, and so it's very uncomfortable. Um, so, and some of these people think that this uncomfortability is part of love or romance, that it must have this tinge of uh, discomfort. And so people end up trying to fill the void because as you stick around, the void gets deeper and people have to find things to fill the void. Um, oftentimes it's turning to self-sabotage, um, self-destructive behaviors, um, you know, just shutting out the light, shutting out the answers, which you're trying to, you know, your, your subconscious is trying to give you like, you know, you are worth more than this. You deserve better than this. So, but you don't want, you know, the subconscious doesn't want to create a pain or, um, a lack of, you know, imbalance. And, and so, and then you push it down. So then you begin living by basically what is defense mechanisms where you're always trying to protect yourself. And then, People's lives become nothing but a whole pile of defense mechanisms, which means they're just trying to protect their truth. When if you can live in that and be in that and be joyful and, you know, everything, you know, the, it's when the judgment really melts away. You stop classifying things as good or bad all the time. The narcissist will always and not have the real rigid thinking or the impulsiveness of like the borderline, but the, the narcissist can be extremely judgmental. I mean, you're always held up to like a, a measuring tape. Um, and you know, they might bring this out and measure you up. I mean, how do you measure up? How do you stack up? What are you here to do for me? I mean, it's, as I've said before, they're, they're, they're like, well, you know, nice to meet me. What can you do for me? That's really kind of like their, their, their operators motorandi. And so people you know originally might be attracted because this might seem very charismatic or different. And so it's like an entertaining, they become very entertaining in this respect. So, but entertainment is, um, is not reality. You know, reality is what you have, you feel, you do in the peace, you know, that you come in that security within where really from w which, you know, your healthy relationship should begin. So if you have to make that correction, you have to make that adjustment realize that there's a peace and a serenity and a focus and a concentration when you come back into your body and you stop judging and evaluating things all the time. This is dirty. This is clean. This is bright. This is dark. This is tall. This is short. Those are all forms of judgment and, you know, constantly living in the analytical left brain. You're always analyzing things. The narcissist is constantly analyzing things and how things will stack up for them. So you feel like, it's an analysis process basically where <laughs> everything is so, um, you know, based on that, that you can't just be and let the relationship flow and have fun and laugh. I mean, think about what happiness is. It's a, it's a chronic state of, of bliss. I mean, it's just, you bring it with you wherever you go. It's not just, you know, what you purchase, what you buy, um, 
you know, the little things that are outside, it's what you feel inside. It's, it's the peace and the knowing. Um, and oftentimes the narcissist, they don't have, they live by, I would say like almost an, an uncertainty. Um, are they going to get their next gig? Are they going to, you know, show this? I mean, I, you know, they're just, you know, kind of retreative, especially in the covert narcissist into their own little world. And so it leaves people dangling, wondering, and really in a state of chronic uncertainty, which is not healthy. It keeps people then absorbing and feeling like they have done something wrong because they're so quiet or they're not sharing because they don't have empathy. People tend to direct this on themselves and say, well, there must be something wrong with me if this person doesn't have empathy. If, you know, so they, they tend to say self-blame and make it think like it's all their fault, especially children. Um, children of narcissistic parents who don't get the love, the true attention, who are able to negotiate with their feelings and help them work through things, you know, they don't ever get that chance um, to have that sense of certainty within. They're just, it, it's a huge, it can be a huge gap um, and, and a difficult uh, tool for people to learn who have been through that and how to adjust to that. So, um, you know, when you, when you think about this, um, you know, let go of a lot of the judgment oftentimes, because that is what is causing a lot of the blacks or people to feel uncomfortable or make poor decisions is that they're, they're wound up, they're creating a stress for themselves or a pressure. And as you always say, you know, pressure is not written on your ceiling. Um, you know, there is no pressure. Um, it's just something that you're, you know, your body is used to getting you into that arousal state. So your body will go there automatically. And it's like an addiction. Your body will become addicted to feelings. So if you become addicted to um, sort of impulsiveness or, um, you know, uh, different behaviors, which are not, you don't make you happy where, why did I eat that? Or why did I do this with this guy or whatever? Why did I do this with this girl? Or why did I quit that job or all the different things that, you know, might have gotten you into trouble. Oftentimes it's because the body is habitually has a habit or an addiction of it's, it's kind of like a well-worn path. If you ever see, you know, like an open field, um, with deer walking, you know, they have a path, you know, thoughts and feelings are like the same way. They create a path in the, in the, in the brain, um, different like neural highways where the axons repeatedly connect, 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 connect. So if you're used to living perhaps with a borderline parent, a narcissistic parent, psychopathic, where you're, they're always on edge, you just, you don't, you're very reactive all the time and they expect you just to be there at the drop of a pin, the drop of a feather. Where were you? You know, why aren't you here? You know, constant, um, berating and, you know, um, just ra you know, razor sharp, um, cruelty oftentimes, which can be very difficult. And so that they, you know, people then pick that up um, from them and they feel that sort of always reactive feeling and that it's based on a judgment and negative assessment. So kids especially tend to think, well, if they're acting this way, it must have been my fault. It must have been something that I did, even though it has nothing to do with you. The parent is you know, with these personality, you know, uh, characteristics and God love them for who they are. They are who they are. Um, you do not have to be responsible for their happiness, their, um, you know, um, evolvement to a higher plane, whatever it is that you have burdened yourself with, release that now. Um, and so I hope this, um, you know, under, helps you to understand that release that now, let them think in sort of toxic or pathological ways. You do not have to participate in that. You don't have to mirror in that. In fact, it's a better idea to be alone, learn to feel the presence of peace and serenity and harmony and sort of that inner concentration, which comes with practice and it comes with sort of recal recalibrating the feelings and energy within your body, which are actually a higher vibration versus the pressure because anxiety and depression are the lower energies. When you get into a state of peace, you get into a state of alignment and your higher powers, which maybe you haven't encountered for a long time. There was a viewer who said she was 51 years old and had never even had never felt that security, that serenity. It's time to let it go. I mean, let it go from your back, your neck, your shoulders, your feet, your forehead, your fingers, let it, let it all go. 
Stop trying to live according to all this judgment and analysis of things and just let it be. Don't try to control it and then just let it be. And um, you will be able to repattern then um, from a, a, a pure consciousness sort of level of, of being. It's uh, really an energy shift because then you realize you're not always in a state of reactivity or uncertainty where you're reacting to impulses of, of uh worked up stress you know i don't know why i ate the cheesecake i don't know why i drank the jack daniels i don't know why i pounded all those beers you know i mean your your body will know what it wants before you know your your body will lead you and your mind will sometimes follow it's you know it's kind of like um what you know uh napoleon hill would say you know when you do that the, the drink is drinking you you're not drinking the drink when things are really sort of out of control like that or you're feeling impulsive or not understanding why and so realize that the subconscious is very powerful so that's where we want to get to make the changes and then furthermore you need to have an identity that isn't caught up in that pressure so oftentimes we are uh, reinforced for having this pressure um, for uh, drinking you know there's so much advertisement just for example um, you know, if you drink, you're cool. If you drink, you're in. If you drink, you're popular. If you drink, you're rich. If you drink, you're sophisticated. You know, whatever, whatever. There's all these assessments that go with, for example, drinking. And so as I was, um, you know, have pondered and synthesized through all my studies is that, you know, an alcoholic, someone who cannot put down the bottle, they always vision themselves as a drinker. In other words, their identity is wound up so tight their dna is so wound up so tight on that i am a drinker and so they always have visions that they will always be that way so the the cure i mean there's so many different things that go into that situation but just for example you know that person needs to be able to see themselves without that bottle without that chocolate without that whatever it is is getting you and can you know getting you uh you know addicted you know, and see that you are calm and see that you have control and you still might want these things in moderation, which is okay, but not to the point where it's, you know, it's the other way around where the food is eating you, the drink is drinking you, the spending is spending you, you know, um, the other way around. So you learn to come into a state of responsibility and responsiveness and not reaction. It's a very subtle change. And I hope you're able to experience that difference between constantly reactive to the sort of standards that have set up by society, narcissists, um, the edginess of the uh, borderline, and see how it's made you reactive versus responding to the call within or being, you know, responding to what you see and then being able to have power and consideration and then participate versus always having to react. It's a whole different ball game and it's much more enjoyable when you're on the other side of the fence when you make it through and you're living in a state of peace harmony an empowered harmonizer and being able to respond and consider versus being reactive and feeling like you're on that limbic brain which will exhaust you and deplete you and make you cause you to feel empty it is the solution. It is your buddy, Peace and Harmony, with you here today. And I hope that these videos do help. Please share and please subscribe for more great tools, videos, discussion, and support.